Welcome. My name is Ken Bamberger. I'm a professor here at the law school uh, and the faculty director of the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. It's in that hat that I welcome you very much here today. Uh, it really is a very special opportunity that a thought leader like Yossi Klein Halevi uh, has been able to spend the day here at Berkeley meeting with students and now in this public program. And I want to announce as well that there'll be another opportunity following this for students only, Berkeley students only. Undergraduates, graduates, all are encouraged to come, uh, which will be at 7.30 this evening with, I think, some dessert, uh, if you haven't eaten enough, at Hillel. Um, I'm grateful to the partnership with Rabbi Adam Naftalin Kelman and Hillel in making this day happen. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to be able to work together uh, so strongly on this campus. And I also uh, want to recognize the generous funding of the Corette Foundation to the Shalom, Shalom Hartman Institute Bay Area Jewish Peoplehood Project, which uh, has brought Yossi Klein Halevi to the Bay Area and enabled him to be here today. Today's uh, dialogue will be hosted by one of our own visiting professors, Professor Hila Shamir, who's a professor at the Buckman Faculty of Law of Tel Aviv University. She's also been uh, visiting faculty at Cornell and at Harvard. She clerked on the Israeli Supreme Court for Justice Eliyahu Maza, studied at Tel Aviv Law School and got her doctorate at Harvard, and studies many of the issues of Israeli society. The division of law between family and market, questions of the state, and its relationships on gender and class and effects on equality and inequality, <clears throat> and explores the relationship of women's paid and unpaid care work, both in Israel and in other countries as well. We're really pleased to have law professor Hila Shamir here with us for the entire year, and we're really pleased that she'll be able to hold this event. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so it's a great privilege to introduce uh, today Yossi Klein Halevi. Uh, Yossi is a senior fellow of the Shalom Hartman Institute, a co-director of the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative. He's a contributing editor to the New York Rep to the New Republic, as well as a frequent contributor to uh, the op-ed pages of other leading North American newspapers. He is an active he's active in reconciliation efforts between Muslim and Jews um, and serves as chairman of Open House, an Arab Jewish coexistence center in the town of Ramle, near Tel Aviv. His first book, Memoirs of a Jewish Extremist, was published in 1995. In 2001, he published uh, at the entrance uh, to the Garden of Eden, a Jewish search for God with Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land. And Yossi's latest book, which he'll be talking with us about today, Like Dreamers, um, the Israeli paratroopers who reunited Jerusalem and divided a nation, uh, won the book of the year, the Jewish Book of the Year Award of 2013. This really breathtaking book, for those of you who still did not get a chance to read it, uh, tells the story of seven of the paratroopers who were among those who captured Jordanian East Jerusalem in June 1967 and unified East and West Jerusalem. And through their life stories, tells the story of Israel's tran transformation and reveals the complexity of current day Israel. The book was described recently in the New York Times Sunday, Sunday Book Review as rendering a complicated history uh, sorry, a complicated history, intimate, human, and relatable, and described Halevi's reporting as meticulous, sensitive, detailed, and incredibly effective at making the small big. 
before I hand over uh, the mic to Yossi, let me just point out um, a technical issue. Uh, the Berkeley uh, Institute of Jewish Law and Israel Studies staff are um, somewhere around here with note cards. Somebody with the note cards? Can you? Oh, here, sorry, Rebecca is here. So some of the uh, staff is gonna be around here and they're gonna hand out note cards. If you have a question, just pick up a note card and a pen, pencil, and write it down. They will discreetly collect them uh, throughout the talk and hand them over to me. And I will um, ask them as part of the Q&A at the end of uh, Yossi's talk. Um, so thank you, and without further ado, Yossi Klein Olivi. Thank you, Hila, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. When uh, I told my wife back in Jerusalem that I was coming to Berkeley, she said, be careful. <laughs> and a friend of mine called me this morning to say, I, I send you blessings for your, for your appearance at, at Berkeley. And I, I, think, I think my friends uh, will be disappointed if I don't get heckled here. So uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to be with all of you, and you seem to be a, uh, a very nice audience. So, uh, <laughs> so. In, uh, in June 1981, as a young journalist, I covered my first Israeli election. And for those of you who remember that election, it was Israel's most brutal. There, it was uh, Shimon Peres versus Menachem Begin. Uh, Begin had just bombed the Iraqi nuclear reactor, and Peres had condemned the bombing and, uh, and said that the Israeli government should, should rely on France, which had provided the reactor to Saddam Hussein, to control the consequences of, uh, of Saddam's nuclear program. There was violence in the street, uh, Likud supporters were attacking labor supporters. Uh, labor and, and labor figures and uh, figures further to the left uh, were making openly uh, anti-Sfaradi, anti-Mizrahi racist statements. Shulamit Aloni, the former head of Meretz, spoke about Likud supporters as primitives beating tam-tam drums. And uh, this was the atmosphere. This was my introduction to Israeli politics. And of course, the settlement movement was in full, in full flower. And this was really the moment when uh, Israel was debating passionately what to do with, with the West Bank. And when I compare the current election season to that seminal moment in Israeli uh, political history, uh, today's election pales fortunately, pales by comparison. Uh, the rhetoric is as nasty as always. The, uh, the, the rhetoric of labor uh, was, it's either us or him, meaning Netanyahu, and Netanyahu responded, it's either me or them. Uh, and that's, that's what passes for, uh, for uh, campaign conversation. But those of you who follow Israel closely will know that this is a very strange election. The issues that one would expect, certainly looking from abroad at, uh, at Israel in 2015, the issues that one would expect would be passionately debated in a fateful moment. We're, once again, we're always at a fateful moment, but this is even a little more fateful. One would expect we would be debating the collapse of the peace process the crisis in Israeli-American relations, which may be unprecedented. And, and in Israel, we always say that crises are unprecedented. And the, to say nothing of the looming showdown over Iran. And yet none of those issues has managed to capture the imagination of the Israeli public. We are simply not debating the issues that the international community would imagine exercises us. Instead, we're debating normal issues. It really is a politics of, of almost wishful normalcy. We're debating the, the cost of housing, 
the cost of living, uh, the growing gap between rich and poor, the crisis of the middle class, uh, all the issues that, that for all these years we always wished we could debate because we really have this longing to be a normal country. And we've chosen one of the most abnormal moments in our history to embrace a politics of normalcy. And I think one reason for that is that Israelis tend to be fairly pragmatic. And your average Israeli looks at the Middle East and says, well, there's really not much we can do to change what's happening. The Middle East is imploding around us. The peace process, the collapse of the peace process, as, as I think most Israelis uh, would say, is certainly not only our fault. Many would say not primarily our fault. There is blame on the other side as well. The crisis with the United States, if this were another president, uh, the Israeli public might be more upset, but Obama is probably the least popular uh, American president in the history of the relationship. And uh, one of the measures of uh, the difference between the American Jewish community and Israel is, is, is President Obama. And so there really is this sense that we might as well deal with the issues at hand that, that we've continuously deferred one election after another when we've been debating the future of the territories and, and the peace process. And now finally we can start dealing with those issues that, that we've really allowed to lapse and to, and, to, and to begin paying attention to what any other society would have long ago addressed. But I think there's a, a deeper reason for why we're not debating the peace process and the future of the Palestinians. And I would say, by the way, that there is more debate in the American Jewish community today over a two-state solution than there is in Israel. And that's not only a function of exhaustion. Partially, it is, but it's not the only reason. And I think the deeper reason is that a majority of Israelis have, at least for ourselves, resolved the question of the Palestinians, which is, if we believe that there is a chance for a two-state solution, 70%, I think, would go for a deal and would be ready to make the most far-reaching concessions. And that's not, that's not a number that I'm, 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 I'm throwing out abstractly. Every poll that I've seen in the last decade shows between 60 to 70%. It fluctuates. Now I would say it's lower. But if there were a real offer on the table, we would see that 70% support a deal. In the absence of, of a credible deal from the perspective of, of a majority of Israelis, the prevailing attitude is we've, uh, we've already been through this debate for, for 30, 40 years and uh, we're going to give it a rest. And so this notion of self-recrimination, of, of, of blaming the government, really is virtually absent from uh, political discourse today. I moved to Israel in 1982, a year after I went to cover the elections. And I found an Israel that was even more divided than it was in 1981. It was the summer of the beginning of the first Lebanon war. And this was the first war that not only failed to unite Israeli society, but was itself the reason for why we were divided. And it was a very strange moment to be moving to Israel. I felt all this pride and thrill at finally coming home, being, joining the Israeli story. And I realized there is no one Israeli story anymore to join. There were two opposing Israeli stories. And these two stories were quite literally shouting at each other on the streets. People were calling each other traitor, Nazi. And there was a sense of, of absolute confusion, even unraveling. Israel was tearing itself apart. And as a new immigrant, 
I had two choices in how to join Israeli society. I could either choose a camp, and many immigrants do that. You choose your Israel, it's comforting. That's the Israel that you, that you stand in. It's the Israel that emotionally supports and reinforces you. Or the option that I did choose was to try to stay open to all different, what we call the tribes of Israel. There's the secular Tel Aviv, Ashkenazi tribe. There's the Mizrahi tribe, now, now the Russian tribe. Uh, the settler tribe, the ultra-Orthodox, we even call the Arab Israelis one of the tribes of Israel. And, and so I tried to listen carefully to the arguments that were being made by the different camps, what the fears were that they were expressing, what their vision of Israeli society was. And in that way, to not only try to become absorbed into Israeli society, but to absorb Israel in all of its complexity as much as I could into, into my being. And that's really how I became an Israeli. Uh, being a journalist at the time made that considerably easier because my, my press pass was a kind of a passport into all of these different communities. I could go in and out of, uh, of the settlers and the peace camp and, and, and listen. And, uh, and that, of course, is what a journalist is supposed to do. And so there was a happy convergence for me between my professional responsibilities and my, what I felt were my civic responsibilities, which was to try to understand the society that I'd come to in as deep a way as possible. And that's not to say that I didn't form opinions, but I didn't rush into those opinions. And I remember. Uh, a few weeks after I moved to Israel, the Sabra Shatila massacre happened, and the famous demonstration of the 400,000. And I felt very pulled to go, and I pulled myself back. I said, don't go. You're not ready yet. You're not ready to join the fray. Before you stand there shouting a slogan, listen to what everyone is saying. And so I, I, I did not go. What I gradually came to realize was that there was wisdom and truth across the political and cultural spectrum, and that no one camp had a monopoly on what Israel really should be. And I served in, in Gaza in, during the First Intifada. I was, I was drafted during the First Intifada. And my unit was sent to the Gaza refugee camps. And we were, we were a, uh, an immigrant unit. And at that time, many Ethiopians uh, were in the unit because the Ethiopians had just come. And patrolling the Gaza refugee camps, I bonded with two, with two friends, in particular in the unit. Uh, and both happened to be African Jews, one from South Africa, the other from Ethiopia. And my friend from South Africa was becoming increasingly demoralized as our service went on. He said, this is exactly what I came here to get away from. And I'm back now in Soweto. That's what he saw in El Burej and Nusarat and the refugee camps in Gaza. My friend from Ethiopia had the exact opposite response. And that was, look at the graffiti on the walls. And the, the graffiti on the walls in Gaza refugee camps is very graphic. Uh, there were maps. There were then maps of Israel with a sword cutting through it and blood dripping out. And he said, this is what they want to do to us. And it's us or them. And what they want to do is send my family back to the refugee camp that we escaped from in the Sudan. And I will do everything I can to make sure that we're not refugees again. Two African Jews, two totally different experiences. And one of, so what I learned from that was that we tend to bring the wisdom and the fears of our, of our various wanderings through, through the diaspora, through Jewish history, and impose them on Israel's dilemmas. And we look at Israel's dilemmas through our, our, our lens. So as an American immigrant, as someone who grew up in the 1960s and 70s in this country, 
I brought a certain pluralistic perspective. And I tried to apply that to the people of Israel as a whole. Because my feeling was that I came to join the Israeli story. And whatever I would find there, whichever way this story unfolded, I'm along for the ride. And what I gradually came to, the political camp that I gradually came to join was in those years, the late 80s, early 90s, was a very lonely place. It was the center. And there were very few Israeli centrists at, at that time. There was a party called the Third Way, some of you may remember, which managed to get uh, three seats, which is why I think they called it the Third Way. <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and then finally disappeared altogether. And that was my party. And what the Third Way said, basically, was we need to be ready to make territorial compromises, but we also need to pay very careful attention to the delegitimization of Israel on the other side and not be fools, not rush in to an agreement. And that seemed to me a, a reasonable way of merging what I felt were the vital insights of the left and the right. Listening through those years to the left, I came to the conclusion that they were right about the occupation. And that, ex and that realization was confirmed for me by my experience in Gaza, my traumatic experience as an occupier and a policeman much more than a soldier in, uh, in Gaza. And at the same time, I realized that the right was warning, the right's warnings needed to be heeded as well, which is how do you make peace with a national movement that doesn't accept your legitimacy in any borders. And so I felt this argument between left and right that was happening out there in Israeli society, especially in those years, the 90s, culminating in the Rabin assassination. I felt that argument tearing me apart inside. It, it's, it's, I internalized that argument. And, and I felt comfortable only in this small camp of misfits known in those years as the third way. The book that I published last year, Like Dreamers, tells the story of the left-right divide through seven paratroopers, as you heard, who fought in Jerusalem in 1967, were at the wall on June 7th, 1967. And I chose seven characters, three of whom went on to become leaders and founders of the settlement movement, four of whom went on to become prominent in the peace movement. The device of the book, the, the, the narrative device, is that when the book focuses say, on a character from the settlement movement, the consciousness of the book is right wing. When it shifts to a character from the left, the consciousness of the book is left wing. And it goes back and forth as a kind of deliberate attempt, really, to disorient the reader and to, uh, to get the reader into the head of that camp that you think is ruining Israel, whether you're left or right. This book took 11 years to write, full-time 11 years. And part of the reason, I think one of the reasons was that it took me a long time to get over my immigrant uh, insecurities of how do I tell this, this story of the mythic elements of Israel, 67, 73, the paratroopers at the wall, the kibbutz, the settlement movement. And so part of this was a kind of a learning experience of growing into a certain self-confidence as an Israeli. And in a way, that was the, I'd say, the completion of, of my civic uh, absorption into Israeli society. But there was, a, for me, a, a, another reason why this book took so long. And that is that for many years, I didn't hear the voice of this book. A writer needs to hear a particular voice from, from your book. And even if readers aren't conscious of a voice, readers intuitively understand that each book has its unique voice. And for years, this book was mute to me. 
and it was driving me crazy. And I couldn't let go of this story because, you know, the more time you invest in it, the more you, you sink into it. And I also felt this deep sense of responsibility to the paratroopers who were given me an enormous amount of their time and trust. And one day, toward the end of these 11 years, uh, I, I woke up, and it was literally like this, and I suddenly realized what the voice of the book was. And the voice of the book was exactly what had thrown me into confusion, because all I heard was a cacophony, left, right, right, left. And I realized that's the voice. The voice is Israel arguing with itself. And that, and that was the moment when I was able to own the book because I realized that's my voice. That's how I became an Israeli, by forcing myself to, 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 to absorb left and right, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, the ultra-Orthodox and the Arab Israelis, to absorb all of these opposing positions, states of, states of consciousness, and that, that, is, that was the book. The question, the, the inevitable question, I think, that the book raises after recounting these, this decades-long struggle between left and right is who won? And the answer is the third way. The third way actually prevailed. Most Israelis today, this 70%, this 70% that I, that I just spoke about before, whether they know it or not, are third way voters. Unfortunately, the third way doesn't exist anymore. But the center has prevailed in Israel in the sense that the immigrant experience that I had of trying to listen deeply to left and right has become a normative Israeli experience. And by that I mean that your average Israeli today is a little bit left and a little bit right at the same time. Your average Israeli gets the occupation, gets that this is poison for Israel. When, is, when, when friends abroad or journalists say to me, don't you Israelis understand what the occupation is doing to you? My response is, we got it in the first intifada. When Yitzhak Rabin was elected in 92 and a majority of Israelis went along with the Oslo process a year later, that was the expression of, we get it. We, under, we got it in the first intifada. The occupation is everything that the left warned us it was going to be, the Israeli left. At the same time, the centrist has a right-wing persona. And the right-wing side of our centrist persona is that side of deep wariness, that side that pays careful attention to what Palestinian leaders tell their own people, to what the Palestinian media writes and speaks about on a daily basis, about the lack of legitimacy of the Jewish people as a people, as an, as an invented nation, without any real roots in this land, the entire history is invented. That has, is a normative position within Palestinian discourse. And so a centrist views a Palestinian state simultaneously in two opposing ways. On the one hand, a Palestinian state is an existential necessity for Israel, for all the reasons you know. Demographic, democratic, Jewish values, uh, eth the, the ethical health, the moral health of Israeli society, our position around the world as, 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 gr as a growing pariah state. For all those reasons and more, a majority of Israelis get it. At the same time, a centrist would view a Palestinian state as an existential threat. An existential threat because replicating the Gaza experience in the West Bank would not threaten only remote Israeli communities uh, that border Gaza, but this time the Israeli heartland. And a few so-called primitive rockets being launched every few days into greater Tel Aviv would cripple Israeli society. 
And given the international atmosphere, what we just experienced uh, in, in the war this summer, if we would have to send the Israeli army back into the West Bank to stop rocket attacks on Tel Aviv, the prevailing Israeli fear is that we would not have the legitimacy internationally to defend ourselves. The Goldstone Report, in that sense, was a psychological watershed for many Israelis. That was the moment that convinced large numbers of Israelis, Israelis like myself, who supported the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza and was hoping that we might do as a fallback position a unilateral withdrawal from the West Bank if we couldn't negotiate a deal because of the fear, the existential fear of, uh, of the occupation. That was the moment when many of us began to have second thoughts because it meant we really might not be able to defend ourselves if we withdraw from the West Bank. And the working assumption in Israel is that if we withdraw from the West Bank, Hamas will take over. And if we redivide Jerusalem, we will end up sharing Jerusalem with Hamas. So like most Israelis today, I feel caught at precisely that point where left meets, <coughs> where left meets right. Uh, another way that I, that I could put this is that I have two nightmares about a Palestinian state. One is that there won't be. Can you help me out here? And the other is that there will be, that there will be. And there are times, there are mornings when I wake up and it is a left-wing morning. And I tell myself, whatever we have to do, just get out. We'll deal with the rockets. Just get out. And there are other times when I wake up and I say, look around you. Are you out of your mind? Hezbollah, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, they're all on our borders. Look around at the Middle East. One country after another is disintegrating. What is Palestine going to look like on our border? And so that's where I'm caught. That's where I think most Israelis today are caught, to one extent or another. And I think each of these existential fears play out in different ways inside of us, and they play out at different times. One tends to be stronger than the other, depending on what's happening in the region. And to just step back for a moment and think conceptually about this, this model that I'm presenting to you, let's look at this moment in the Jewish calendar and look at the holidays that we are now between, Purim and Passover. And these are two holidays that for me represent the divide between left and right in our generation. We have Purim Jews and we have Passover Jews. And I'll explain what I mean. Our generation has been bequeath two commandments, two biblical commandments from Jewish history. The first is to remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt and don't do to others what was done to you. Don't be brutal. The second commandment, and that of course, that is the commandment, let's call it, of Passover. The second commandment is remember what Amalek, the tribe of Amalek did to you when you were leaving Egypt and you were searching for water in the desert and you were attacked without provocation and Amalek tried to wipe you out. Amalek in Jewish mythic uh, consciousness has symbolized the genocidal enemies throughout the, throughout the millennia that the Jewish people faced. And so the message of remember what Amalek tried to do to you is don't be naive. Now, I call that consciousness a Purim, that is a Purim consciousness. Haman was said to be of the tribe of Amalek, that's what the scroll of Esther tells us. And so, where we are, where we are positioned literally now in, the Jewish, in Jewish time is where I believe we are positioned politically, spiritually. 
And the reason that I believe the Palestinian conflict is so tormenting for Jews is because the Purim and Passover commandments converge and conflict on this issue. The stranger in our midst is the enemy that wants to disinherit us. The Palestinian conflict presents us with a challenge, a profound challenge to our most cherished notion of ourselves as a humane people, on the one hand, and the Palestinian issue has also become the pretext for the renewed criminalization of the Jewish people around the world. The, the longer, and I think that, that the fact that we are still in a position as a people where we have to justify our right to exist, that we have to explain that Israel has the right to exist, I think on some level this is maddening for Jews, justifiably so. And the more we succeed, and this is our paradox, the more we succeed in re-indigenizing ourselves in the land of Israel, one generation after another of native-born Israelis, the more the process, the more our indigenousness is being called into question. And this we find intolerable. So these two sensibilities converge and clash on the Palestinian issue. One of the puzzles, one of the questions that I asked myself while I was writing this book was why is it that left and right didn't listen to each other's warnings? Why didn't the right take seriously all those years when the left was warning about the consequences of occupation? Why did it have to blow up in our faces? Why, and that happened in the first Intifada. Why didn't the left listen to the warnings from the right about Yasser Arafat and trying to make peace with the PLO, which blew up in our faces in the second Intifada? And I think that one of the reasons is that each side knew that it was speaking from a deep truth of Jewish history. The left knew they were speaking from this, from this, from this inviolate place of a Passover consciousness. The right knew it was speaking the deepest truth of Purim. And so they shouted past each other. And in a way, that's partly what my book is about. And that's what makes my book a, 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 a sad story, a frustrating story. Because for 30 years, we shouted past each other. We've reached the point now, and I do end with that in the book, we've reached the point now where the center has emerged and we've internalized that split. Not to say that left and right don't exist in Israel. Classical, hardcore, ideological, I have all the truth on my side, right and left. That exists, but much less than in the past. And in that sense, I feel there's been a maturation of Israeli society. When I travel among American Jewish communities, I often feel that I'm in a time warp. And, and when, I, when I speak to orthodox or right-wing communities, it's the 1970s and the 1980s. And Begin and Shamir are still in power, and the first intifada hasn't happened and never will happen. Because all we have to do is assert our, our claim to what belongs to us, and, and the Middle East will, will be forced to come to terms with, with our notion of our borders. When I speak in liberal communities, it's the 1990s. And the second intifada hasn't happened. And all we have to do is stop building in the settlements and have the will to sign an agreement because we all know what the agreement is going to look like. So just do it because we're the obstacle and we have partners on the other side. Most of us in Israel no longer believe that either option is possible. And if you look at have, have people here read Amos Oz's op-ed in the LA Times this past Sunday? Some people read it. It's really worth reading. It's a very important piece. It's a wonderful piece. And Amos Oz writes that if we don't create a Palestinian state immediately, now, Israel will be destroyed. The Jewish state, if we don't have two states, we'll have one state, and the one state will not be a Jewish state. It won't be a state on our terms. We will lose Israel. Now, what's, what I find so interesting about that is when I read Amos Oz, 
or someone else on the left, I say, yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> but then when I read Bennett in the New York Times, Naftali Bennett of the Jewish home, and he says, look at reality. Look at what would happen if we create a Palestinian state now. We will not be able to defend ourselves, and that's an existential threat. And I say, yeah, that's, that makes sense. And they both belong, to my mind, to the same camp. And that's the camp of the half right. Each side understands a particular existential threat and completely ignores the other side. That is a dysfunctional debate. I often asked myself another question while I was writing the book. And that is, why didn't we have a civil war in Israel? Now, we, we came close. The assassination of Rabin was, was in, in some sense, a kind of civil war. And yet, we pulled back from the abyss. And what puzzled me was the emotions ran so high in those years. Both sides were so convinced that, that this was an that if, they, if the other camp prevailed, Israel would be destroyed, the Amos Oz position. Why didn't we have a civil war? And one of the answers I felt was what I discovered about my seven characters. And that these men who went on to become very well-known figures in Israel, I would say most of them were, were at some point household names. They were profound political rivals, and at the same time, some of them profound friends across the political and cultural divides. In fact, the most powerful friendships in the book were those that happened across the divides, and some of the most uh, bitter enmities were, were being fought within each camp. And the reason I believe that we didn't have a civil war is because Israel is too intimate a society. And the leaders of the settlement movement and the leaders of the anti-settlement movement fought together in one war after another. 1967, the War of Attrition in 1969, 1973, 1982 was their last war. They retired after the Lebanon War. But they would, they would come together year after year on reserve duty, argue vehemently, attend each other's family uh, events, and, uh, and meet on, literally meet on opposite sides of the police barricades. When I think about the situation within the American Jewish community, what you lack as a whole is a shared tent, is a common tent. And that's part of the difference of experiencing Jewishness as a community and Jewishness as a, as a people. When you experience it as a people, you don't have the ability to create self-selecting communities. I mean, we do. Of course, we have our tribes in Israel. But these tribes are not able to insulate themselves completely from each other. We keep getting thrown in together in shared experiences. And so we can't entirely avoid those Jews whom we detest. And everyone in Israel has a long list of Jews who we wish lived elsewhere. <laughs> but, but they don't. And in fact, we have entire categories. We have whole tribes of Jews that we wish somehow would leave. And that is the painful but essential experience of, of, of living as a kind of a, a hothouse of, of peoplehood. In the diaspora, you have the choice of creating self-selecting, relatively homogeneous experiences. You don't have to deal with Jews who you don't like, if you, on a daily basis, certainly not. And so what worries me about the discourse here, which is, I, as, as you know better than I, is becoming more bitter on Israel, and now with Iran thrown into the mix, it's going to be more bitter still. What worries me is the absence of a shared tent. Now, I'm not worried about a civil war here. God forbid, American Jews aren't going to start shooting each other. But, but I am worried about a drifting away, a, an alienation in which you're going to come to the point where, where American Jews will not share the most minimal 
common language, certainly about Israel. And I don't think we're that far from that point. So I don't have a solution for that, but I'm putting this on the table as an urgent matter for why, in a way, I would say for one reason why I wrote this book. And that was to create a shared narrative about Israel between left and right. Now, between 1948 and 1967, we as a people had more or less a consensus about what Israel means to us. That shared consensus broke down the day after the Six Day War, what we call in Israel the seventh day. And we've been living in the prolonged seventh day in some sense ever since. Today, you have part of the Jewish people that sees the Six Day War and its consequences as the greatest blessing in Israeli history and another part that sees the Six-Day War and its results as the greatest curse in Israel's history. And that worries me in terms of our ability as a people to create a shared narrative. If I had to define the Jews in one line, it is that we are a people, we are a story. We are a story that we tell ourselves about who we think we are. And that's why the Seder is our most shared ritual. That's the moment when we come back to the beginning and try to figure out, once again, who are we and what does this story mean? The fact that we are unable among ourselves to share the most minimal narrative on Israel is, in its way, a kind of existential threat to the long-term ability of the Jews to, to, to be to say nothing of our ability to respond to those who are trying to destroy our narrative from without. The, the book that I wrote is not a shared narrative. We, we, we are not able at this point to create a shared narrative between left and right, but it is a shared tent. It is what I was hoping to do was create a book that left-wing readers and right-wing readers would be able to find themselves in the same story. And so that's another reason why the book goes back and forth between these opposing narratives. Perhaps I'll end with looking forward to an imaginary moment when we could solve this problem. What would it, what would, and I don't mean, I don't mean a map, I mean conceptually. What are the ideas that we need to bring to the negotiating table? What, are the, what is the, the, the approach that Israel needs to come with in order to, to make peace? And I would argue that we need a left-wing solution with a right-wing sensibility. And I'll explain what I mean. The left-wing solution is what the left said all along it needs to be, which is a two-state solution. And bear in mind that until the late 1990s, even the Labor Party opposed the two-state solution. This was a position on the far left of Israeli politics. Yitzhak Rabin's last speech in the Knesset before being assassinated was essentially his three no's. No, withdra no, no withdrawal to the 67 lines, no withdrawal from the Jordan Valley, no redivision of Jerusalem. And Rabin, in private, opposed a Palestinian state. We would somehow muddle through, and that was Rabin's position. And, and today, whether Netanyahu means it or not, he has to at least pay lip service to a two-state solution because the mainstream has shifted so drastically over the last 15 years. And political discourse has, has really moved and embraced the left-wing position. But a left-wing position on its own, I believe, is inadequate and will not bring us to peace. And that's for a very simple reason, because the left, by and large, is incapable of meeting the Palestinian national movement where it is 
in the sense that when we sit with the Palestinian negotiators, their starting point is the whole land between the river and the sea belongs to us, and we are give, you are asking us to give up something that belongs to us. Who, the, who I want at the table representing me is somebody who will tell the Palestinians the same thing. The land between the river and the sea belongs to us. We will, we're ready for the sake of peace, for the sake of recognizing the competing narrative and recognizing that we're not the only claimant to this land. We're ready with deep reluctance to give up what belongs to me, not what was seized unjustifiably, not land in which we're strangers or colonialists. We can't be colonialists in our own land. It is ours, from the river to the sea. As a religious Jew, for me, Hebron is far more precious than Tel Aviv. I love Tel Aviv. I have two kids living there. But it is a baby city. It's a city built on sand, barely a century old. Hebron is where I feel that I've come home. And so when a Palestinian tells me that Jaffa belongs to him, my response is, you're right. Jaffa does belong to you because the tragedy of this land is that this land between the river and the sea is actually two lands, physically one land, but conceptually two. It's the land of Israel and the land of Palestine. And each side can make a compelling claim based on its own narrative for why the totality of this land belongs to them. So when I, what I tell a, Palest, a Palestinian is, yes, you're right, Jaffa does belong to you. The problem is that Hebron belongs to me. And so if Jaffa belongs to you and Hebron belongs to me, we have one of two choices. We can continue this war for another 100 years. Maybe you'll win or maybe I'll win. Maybe one or the other will just give up and leave. Or we can go to a solution which is a profoundly unjust solution, and that's partition. The diplomats and the international community have continuously misread the emotional state of both peoples. A majority on both sides believe deeply that this land belongs to them. And from my point of view, they're both right. When I see Palestinian maps without Israel, I, I, I accept that. Because my map doesn't have Palestine. If we're going to reach peace, then we're going to have to agree to inflict on ourselves an act of historic injustice. To deprive Israel of Hebron, for me, is a kind of amputation. I think about it, and it's almost physically unbearable. For Palestinians, I imagine a similar process in the thought of having to give up their claim to what is now the state of Israel. And so when I say a right-wing sensibility for a left-wing with a left apply to a left-wing solution, it is not the Israeli left or the American Jewish left that says we are occupiers in the West Bank. It is the Israeli right, which, or the pragmatic Israeli right, which says we have come home to Judea and Samaria. And it is, for me, Judea and Samaria. And so I'm ready, reluctantly, painfully, to accommodate the competing claim for the sake of peace, for the sake of partial justice, but not, but not because it's not mine. And that is a position that I believe the Israeli center really deeply embodies. And if you think about it, the only Israeli leaders who have ever withdrawn from territory are the pragmatic right the non-religious Israeli right, the non-settler the non, the non right. And that's really what I've learned, I'd say, over the years. It's what I've learned from, from writing this book. And I hope that we as a people will learn the wisdom of listening to the wisdom that's in the rival camp, the camp that 
that one so profoundly disagrees with, because there is, just as there is wisdom in my camp, there's wisdom in your camp as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, we have received many, many, many questions, so I have to apologize in advance for not being able to read all them. Would you like to sit now or yeah, great. have this more like a conversation if you want to? Yes, of course. Um, so I'm going to try and kind of group the questions um, into uh, the various themes that came about, and I'm sorry, again, if I'm going to miss some of your uh, questions um, by the end of it. Um, Okay, so the questions generally were about either about politics in Israel at the moment or pol the Jewish politics in U.S. at the moment, in the U.S. at the moment, and some of them we'll end with were about, sorry, were about uh, your project and, um, and your book. So we'll end with those. And let's start with the kind of the grouping of questions that, um, that actually tried to look at both Israel and the US. Uh, so several questions were about religiosity. Um, the fact that um, you talk about the, the, the big tent in, in Israel versus the US, but the fact that the, in, in the US today, it seems like um, Americans are really connected, by, connected through being Jewish, while in Israel there's a huge conflict about that exactly between being uh, Jewish and religious and between be versus being secular um, because uh, Judaism is not your necessarily your identifying characteristic when you are in Israel. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, the, a generation ago, the Israeli cultural divide uh, would have been uh, defined, there were several, there was Ashkenazi and Mizrahi, but especially secular and religious. I don't believe that that divide exists anymore. Should I repeat that? <laughs> I think we don't have a secular religious divide anymore. We have an ultra-Orthodox everyone else divide. <laughs> and that's a tremendous change for Israeli society. And this last government really embodied that divide. This was the first government that excluded ultra-Orthodox parties since the Likud took over in 1977. And the exclusion was engineered by a coalition of two parties, Yair Lapid's Yesh Atid, which represents supposedly the secular, although Yesh Atid in itself embodies this idea of a post-secular religious split because it is Israel's first secular religious party. I think that's the real significance of Yesh Atid. And they joined together briefly with Naftali Bennett's right-wing pro-settler party, the Jewish Home, in order to force Netanyahu to keep out the ultra-Orthodox. That was the defining moment. That was the message to the Israeli public that something new has happened. Now, in the last, in, in over the, the history of, of, of Zionism and then the early years of the state, uh, the culture war could really have been described as a war between the Israelis and the Jews. And, and I mean that only half ironically. Uh, the Israelis believed they were creating something entirely new, severed from the last 2,000 years. And uh, the Jews saw the state as an organic continuity of an unbroken Jewish history. The Jews won. The Jews won that, that culture war. And you see, it, you see it in Israeli culture today. You see it in Israeli film, which is increasingly preoccupied with Jewish subjects on Israeli TV. And you see it most profoundly in Israeli popular music, which in the last years has become heavily dominated by Jewish, even religious, explicitly religious themes. And this is not a phenomenon that's happening on the sidelines. Israel's leading uh, rock singers, rock bands, over the last five to 10 years are involved in a project of, of merging modern Israeli culture 
with traditional Jewish themes. Barry Sakharov, who is Israel's greatest rockist, as we say, uh, Ehud Banai, Eviatar Banai, all the Banais, Mayor Banai. Uh, the, these are Israel's leading, leading creators of, uh, of Hebrew music in this generation. And what's so important about this, I think, what's so telling, is that in the past, Hebrew music was the carrier of the secular Zionist revolution. And Hebrew music today is the carrier of the rejudaization of Israeli society. Now the question facing us today is not whether Jewish identity will be an important part of Israeli identity. I think the question is, what kind of Jewish identity? Is it going to be a Jewishness that is worthy of a free, sovereign people in its land? Or is it going to be a continuation of the ghetto Judaism that we imported from our minority past, a very wary and, and suspicious uh, form of Judaism that is the Judaism of the official rabbinate. And I'm very hopeful about, about the future of Judaism in Israel because finally I see the beginnings of a struggle. When it was secular versus religious, uh, there was no real struggle for Judaism because the secular were saying, this is no real interest for us. Now, growing numbers of Israelis are beginning to think about what kind of Judaism do we need. And this creates an opening for the first time, a real shared relationship between, between American Jews and Israelis over the question of the future of Judaism, which belongs to, to all, all of us equally. And, and I, I, this is something that I think also we need to put very firmly on our communal agenda. Thank you. Um, so uh, along these lines of kind of comparing uh, communities, but starting to move towards the bulk of questions that were about recent politics, um, how does uh, Israeli society view the conflict within American Ju the, the Jewish community in, in the US about right, left, J Street versus APAC? Um, and especially, and if you, if you can talk especially about um, Israel's view of Obama. And, and um, you were talking about Obama as being one of the, uh, most le the least popular American presidents, but is it really, uh, is the uh, kind of the, the Bibi Obama versus uh, Begin Carter relationship? How, how would you uh, relate to that? Well, to begin with, in terms of uh, Israeli perceptions of American Jewry, I think that uh, increasing numbers of Israelis are actually for the first time interested in American Jewry. And this is, um, this is partly a result of travel over the years and a lot of Israelis who had exposure in one way or another to non-Orthodox forms of Judaism and were, were, were surprised by the vitality that they discovered. Uh, and there's been an influence on the rise of indigenous forms of non-Orthodox uh, Israeli Judaism uh, based on, uh, on, on what was learned by visiting Israelis here. And that's still a minority phenomenon, but <coughs> nevertheless, I think, I think significant. Uh, another reason that Israelis are paying more attention is because they finally understand that they can't take American Jewish support for granted anymore. And so the renewed interest is, is based in part on anxiety. The, in terms of, uh, of J Street, APAC, Israelis, most Israelis aren't that aware of the nuances. Uh, they're more concerned, I think, about just a general drifting away. Uh, it's, only, it's only Israelis who pay very close attention here that I think would really know what <laughs> J Street was. But um, so those, those issues really, I think, don't, don't quite resonate. But bear in mind that there's been a, a great psychological shift in Israel in recent decades. And that's expressed in, in several ways. One is the old contempt for the, for the diaspora is gone, virtually gone. You'll find it still on, the, on some circles on the right, 
but for the most part, Israelis uh, don't regard the diaspora uh, as, a, um, as a failing enterprise and certainly don't believe that Israel is the repository of all Jewish wisdom. I think, I think uh, recent uh, decades have not been kind to Israeli, uh, uh, to Israeli arrogance. <laughs> um, and, um, and so there really is a sense of, um, of, of interest in, in, to some extent. I don't want to overstate it, but to some extent, there's an openness now. Uh, in Israel, we don't really speak about emigres anymore as yordim, the pejorative term that means those who descend. Uh, we speak about them as mehagrim, as, as emigres. Uh, there's been a, a, a process of um, a kind of a healthy normalization of, uh, and I think the Russian immigration had a lot to do with this. We're, we're, we no longer live in this acute state of anxiety of how many are coming, how many are leaving. Uh, we, you know, there, there was a feeling during the Russian years that uh, we, we, we really, we, we, have, we have enough immigrants. And, uh, and, so, and so that anxiety has been, to a great extent, uh, the demographic anxiety has been, has been lessened. And all of that means that, um, the, the only, I'd say, again, the only real fear that, um, that Israelis have about American Jews is uh, are, they, are they turning their backs on Israel? And that is a, a widespread realization uh, that that possibility is widespread. In terms of Obama, the Israeli public did not begin detesting Obama. In fact, when he came to, uh, to Israel for the first time in July 2008 as a candidate, Israelis were, were charmed, much the way that many Americans were charmed. And there was a certain Obama envy that I, I heard from lots of Israelis, which was, why can't we have young, smart politicians? <laughs> and, um, and, and, and there really was that sense. And the, the first crisis, you all know, was the Cairo speech, which Israelis were really shocked by, that, he, that Obama could only come up with, with the Holocaust as a justification for Israel's existence, which of course reinforced the narrative prevalent in the Muslim world that, that, the, that the Muslims are paying the price for the Holocaust. And, uh, and it just got worse from there. Without going through the whole sordid story, uh, there was one more chance in the relationship, and that happened when Obama came, was it a year ago? I mean, it feels like it was, you know, really 20 years ago. Uh, when he came again for the first time as president, and it was a very successful trip. And I was writing at the time for the New Republic. I, I, I no longer am a contributing editor. I don't know if anybody is. We, uh, we, all, we all left. And, uh, and uh, I was at the time writing, uh, I was covering uh, Obama's visits and, and uh, the, the evolution or devolution of Israeli attitudes toward Obama. And the New Republic was, as, you, as I think some of you know, uh, quite friendly to Obama. And I wrote this glowing piece about, um, about his trip and how, how moving it was for Israelis. And then the whole thing fell apart. And it fell apart, the, the definitive moment of collapse uh, of Israeli trust in Obama was the red line over Syria. And that, in fact, was the moment when the whole Middle East came to realize that when Obama has been saying all along that all options are on the table uh, regarding Iran, he never meant it. Uh, and there is today, according to polls, uh, the trust, I think there was one poll that showed 11% of Israelis believe that Obama will stop Iran, 11%. Uh, and uh, most Israelis, Israelis are very divided over Netanyahu's speech in Congress. They are not at all divided about what he said in Congress. Uh, David Grossman, who is in some sense uh, really this, he and Amos Oz are kind of the spiritual heads of the peace camp. And the novelist David Grossman uh, told an interviewer recently that uh, the American administration is criminally naive, that's an exact quote, criminally naive about Iran, and that even though Grossman thinks that Netanyahu made a major mistake, a major tactical mistake, 
in speaking in Congress, the administration needs to pay attention to what Netanyahu was saying, because Netanyahu was right. Now, if David Grossman is saying that, you can imagine what they're saying in the Machna Yehuda market in Jerusalem. So, so in terms of the divide between Israel and American Jews, the divide is over Obama, and what I'm really worried about, because that's, that's just a, a theoretical divide, the real divide is going to be over Iran, and that's where we're going to see very, a very bitter argument coming, and, uh, and we're not ready for that as Israelis and American Jews. We haven't begun figuring out how are we going to have this argument uh, in a way that doesn't break us apart. ...questions that were about kind of using you as someone who can inhabit both the right and the left, asking you to justify both right and left positions in Israel. So a set of questions were about um, the 70% who would agree to a two-state solution. What the, the questions were kind of step into the prophet's uh, uh, shoes and tell us what would that agreement would look like? What do you think 70% of the Israeli population would agree to? What would such a state, two-state solution would look like, especially considering problems of enforcement, right? We, run the, we want the other side to be a side that can control their population. Um, so kind of, can you, can you uh, uh, talk yeah, well, more about that? I, I would have once answered without hesitation that if there is a Palestinian leader that is ready to say we will confine right of return to a Palestinian state and we will accept the we will accept your definition of Israel whether a Jewish state or the homeland of the Jewish people and the state of all of its citizens however one wants to combine those and uh, I would have once said unequivocally 70-80% of Israelis would be ready to, to go back to the equivalent of, of uh, the Six-Day War borders with, with readjustments, territorial swaps, redividing Jerusalem. I'm no longer sure. And I think that, that the situation in the Middle East has put a big question mark for many Israelis for practical reasons, not for ideological reasons about what it, whether we could actually share Jerusalem, whether we could be the first two countries in, 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 in history to happily share a capital. After a 100-year war with all the pressures of the Middle East, huge question mark. The polls consistently show a majority today opposing the redivision of Jerusalem in a way that was not necessarily true in the past. So I don't know. I don't know what would happen if we had a Palestinian leader who turned, who, who, who played Sadat and who said, I will, I accept a Jewish state, I, I, I accept right of return only to the state of Palestine. If that were, if that, if we had a leader who said that, I, I think that many Israelis today would be, would be swept up in the same way that we were when Sadat came. The day before Sadat landed in Israel, you had an overwhelming majority against the withdrawal to the 67 lines in Sinai. Begin himself said he's going to retire in one of the settlements in Sinai. And then Sadat comes and he's cheered in the streets of Jerusalem, and it's Begin who withdraws to the 67 lines. So it's hard to say, but, but certainly for the Israeli side, the prerequisite is right of return, Palestinian concession, which was the Clinton proposals of December 2000. More or less Israeli withdrawal to the 67 lines in exchange for Palestinian concession on right of return. And that's the reason that I think Arafat rejected the Clinton proposals because of right of return. And I don't see Abbas or any Palestinian leader at this point accepting the equivalent of the Clinton proposals. If there were to be a Palestinian leader, then as we say in the Middle East, God is great. So. Um, now, uh, so uh, in this stream of questions, can you uh, speak a little bit about the right wing position uh, in relation to the Palestinian right of return and just the, the mere occurrence of 1948 as a moment in which Palestinians were Ha were forced to leave their homes. 
um, how does the right deal with, with that? Well, first of all, first of all, it's not just the right. Tsipi Livni was once asked, how many refugees or descendants of refugees uh, are you prepared to accept in the state of Israel? And her answer was, the number is zero. That's Tsipi Livni. So the notion that this is a right-wing issue is, is, is a profound misreading of the Israeli map. I think in Israel, uh, the only faction that would probably be ready to consider um, what, I, what I would regard as, as, as an intolerable uh, violation of, a, of the logic of a two-state solution, which is we are responsible for the Jewish diaspora, the Palestinian state is responsible for the Palestinian diaspora. The only party in Israel that I think, Jewish party, that would reject, that would be ready to begin to bend those, those principles would be merits. And, uh, but ev everyone to the right of merits, which is to say labor, Livni, uh, is, um, I think, strong against right of return. And, and, and the Israeli electorate would simply revolt if, uh, if we had to give up, if, if we had to withdraw to the 67 lines and accept Palestinian refugees into Israel. That is simply uh, not going to happen. Uh, so in terms of, um, of how, I'd say, normative Israelis view 1948, uh, without guilt, uh, there is virtually no guilt in Israel about 1948 uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the fact that uh, the, nor the mainstream Zionist movement accepted partition in 1947, the Arab world uh, went to war, um, the fact that, the, that 1948 was a zero-sum war for both sides, and that wherever Arab armies were victorious, Jews were either massacred or expelled, and that was the, no that was the nature of the war in 1948. And in terms of expulsion, many Arabs were expelled, many were not expelled, many fled, and, uh, and many remained in their homes, which is why we have uh, over a million Arab Israelis, Palestinian Israelis today. The other piece of this is that you have in Israel at least half the Jewish population uh, that are descended from Jewish refugees. What uh, Ben Jor Yamini, who is a... Um, a, uh, a columnist from Yidiot uh, calls the Jewish Nakba, uh, which is uh, close to a million Jews who fled or were thrown out uh, from their homes from ancient diasporas. Iraq, the Iraqi Jewish community goes back 2,500 years, and it ended in one month in 1951, the largest airlift of anyone in history, 100,000 Jews from Iraq to Israel. And, um, and so, Israelis don't feel guilty about 1948. There are some writers who do, but uh, they are a minority, and you might have read some, but they are really a minority. Uh, they don't speak for normative Israelis. There was a, um, uh, one of the uh, candidates on the labor list, uh, Professor Yona, uh, a um, quite left-wing uh, social activist, uh, was, um, was quoted by the Likud just now. The, the Likud, you know, and they dig up old quotes from uh, each other's candidates. And they found out that Yona had said uh, at one point that, um, that uh, Holocaust Memorial Day and Nakba Day should be, should be observed on the same day. And this created an enormous scandal in Israel, and Yona had to walk that back. No, I didn't mean it, and it's of course it's taken out of context. But that gives you some idea of how um, the notion of Nakba is, uh, is very, very um, unpopular among Israelis. Um, so, so you were talking about Arab Israelis. Can you comment a bit about this, the situation of Arab Israelis? There are about 20% of the population in Israel. Um, we were talking a lot about Israel, but mostly about the Jews in Israel. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I very much appreciate the question. I think that um, Israel's greatest domestic challenge is how to begin to absorb into the mainstream its two peripheral populations, 
which are also its fastest growing populations, the ultra-Orthodox on the one hand, and the Arab Israeli or the Palestinian Israelis on the other. And I think that the way in which to begin to approach this question is to realize that each community needs a different approach, in fact, an opposite approach. I think that the ultra-Orthodox won't begin to be part of the mainstream until they are until their parties continue to be excluded from coalitions, at least for the foreseeable future, until we can manage to complete the legislation that will mandate ultra-Orthodox young men serving in the army, getting jobs. That began with the last government, thanks to Yesh uh, but but it, it, it is just at its early stages. If we have ultra-Orthodox parties sitting in government, it will destroy uh, the fragile beginnings of this transformation. So on the one hand, in, and the paradox is in order to absorb the ultra-Orthodox into the mainstream, they need to at least be temporarily excluded from government. With Arab Israelis, it's exactly the opposite. We need to have Arab political parties in government. The question is, what kind of parties? And it's not a coincidence that there have not been any Arab parties in any government. We have had, uh, we had, I believe, one Arab minister. I think it was under Rabin, but he was he came from labor. Uh, there have not been any Arab parties sitting in government, and that isn't only because of the Jewish side. It's also because of the Arab side. Uh, the notion of sitting in what they call a Zionist government is anathema for most. Arab politicians in Israel today. Now the tragedy of Arab politics, from, from my point of view, is that it is a politics that is defined by nationalist goals rather than integrationist and civil liberties, civil rights goals. And we don't yet have an Arab party that places Israeli integration ahead of Palestinian nationalism, to say nothing of, is, of the Islamist party that we have in the Knesset. We have a, a pro-Hamas party. And, and so there is this great paradox in, in Arab-Israeli uh, political culture, which is that every poll shows that a majority of Arab voters want an integrationist political agenda. They don't want their leaders to emphasize Palestinian nationalism, which has a devastating effect on, on Israeli Jews. It confirms all of their worst fears and it plays right into the hands of the demagogues like Lieberman, that the Arabs are a fifth column. I think that some of the Arab Knesset members are a fifth column, but that the Arab population as a whole is not. And so I think that, that, that a large part of the responsibility rests on the Jewish majority, and we don't yet know psychologically. We haven't learned psychologically how to act like a majority. We're still, we still have a certain minority mentality, but there is responsibility as well on the side of, uh, of Palestinian citizens of Israel. If they want an integrationist agenda, they need to start sending uh, representatives to the Knesset who promote a civil rights agenda. So I don't see that happening in this election. Uh, the United Arab List that was formed is, I think, a step backwards because any united list will, will operate from the lowest common denominator and it gives veto power to the nationalists and the Islamists. So we are not going to see the emergence anytime soon of, a, uh, of an integrationist agenda unless the united list falls apart uh, after the elections, which is the expectation. So um, thank you so much. We had many good questions about anti-Semitism on U.S. campuses and Israeli society in terms of class and gender and ethnicity and whether Herzog and Livni are really the third way. But we will not be able to cover all of them. We had many other good questions. The short so answer of that is no. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just end with a couple of questions about uh, your own work. Um, so first of all, if you can tell us whether your book was translated into Hebrew uh, and how it was received, um, or, and if it wasn't tra translated, why not? And also, what are you working on now, and what are you going to work on next? <laughs> well, uh, the book is being translated. 
I, uh, I, had a, I had a slow start. Uh, I, I, um, I spent a good part of last year here, and I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, begin to really tend to the translating until the last few months. But uh, uh, the book, uh, God willing, will be coming out uh, probably a year from now. It's, uh, it's, it's a slow process. I'm, I've just changed translators. I think part of the problem for me is, um, is, is you know, if the book were being translated into, into Latvian, I wouldn't be able to, 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 <laughs> to know whether it's a good translation or not. And uh, my Hebrew isn't good enough for me to actually translate it myself, but it is good enough to know <laughs> that the translation that I had until now is not what I wanted. So, uh, so I'm a very difficult uh, author for a translator to deal with because I'm, I, I'm hovering uh, over, over them. So uh, hopefully uh, with the next translator, we're going to figure out a way of, uh, of, of working. Uh, in terms of what I'm writing now, I, I've begun a book which is um, basically about explaining ourselves, uh, explaining Israel, Zionism to Muslims. And it's an outgrowth of, uh, of the project that, uh, Hila, you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, I'm the co-director at the Hartman Institute of a project called the Muslim Leadership Initiative, uh, which was a secret project until recently. Uh, it, uh, we bring to Israel uh, groups of young emerging Muslim American leaders, uh, Muslim chaplains from leading American campuses, journalists, writers, community leaders, most of them under the age of 40, uh, to, uh, to, to teach uh, a Hartman curriculum about uh, what Israel means to the Jewish people and to Judaism. And it's an extraordinary experience. And this program has now gone public and uh, it is under severe attack by, by parts of the Muslim American community. Uh, we have two cohorts so far and we're about to set up a third, inshallah. And, um, and so it really is a, um, it's, it's, it's what I'm learning through this experience is, um, is how to speak to Muslims. And these are, these are religious Muslims, women in hijabs. These are serious mainstream, what we could say from Muslims, if we can use the Yiddish word. And, um, and there is a, um, it's a learning process for both sides. And I'm trying to write something about how to speak to the Muslim world about who we are and why we're there. Uh, I have promised my wife that this book will not take 11 years. <laughs> and uh, I'm giving myself a very tight deadline. And uh, the one thing that I do know for sure about this book is that it will not take anywhere near that long. And I hope within the next year to, uh, to be free of this. So thank you all very much. Thank you.